We do it every day at this time. John McMullen talking NFL and Eagles with us. We sprinkle a little AAF for you from time to time. Told you earlier today, the Arena Football League, we had Coach Ron James on the show. Ron Jaworski tonight at 5.30. Nick Costco, the new play-by-play voice of the Atlantic City Arena team, which has yet to reveal its name. And by the way, I don't know what the name is, to be honest with you. They say they do know the name. I don't know what it is. So when we get it, we'll let you know. They open up the season April 27th, which, you know, April 27th is a busy day, John McMullen. It is the finals of the AAF, if they get that far. It is also the final day of the NFL draft, and it is the opening day of the Arena Football League. So April 27th has football of all kinds. It should be National Football Day. Yeah, it should be. I, I think the I think the NFL is going to get the most interest, but that's just a guess. <laughs> yeah, by the way, guess. we didn't talk about this the other day because we were kind of going into the AAF stuff, but I did find – the ratings they had were actually not that bad. They had over a million people watching them on uh, TNT the other night. Yeah, that's that's solid, especially in today's uh, television world uh, where everything is uh, declining. We've talked about it a lot. Uh, anytime you're over a million and you're sort of a, a niche product, that's that's pretty good, yeah. even even on a station like TNT. Yeah, ratings were decent for uh, AAF week number two. All right, uh, let's get into some NFL stuff, though. Le'Veon Bell, you wrote about him today at 973ESPN.com. And quite frankly, you know, there are some reports out there that the Eagles would be one of the teams that would be interested. I don't know if it's a report so much as, yeah, that makes some sense, but Jets, Eagles, a couple of other teams out there. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, makes sense or no for Philadelphia? No, I, I don't think it makes sense from a financial perspective. Uh, I've talked about it a lot. Le'Veon didn't set, set out a year uh, to take less money uh, to go to a contender or anything of that nature. He's looking for a, a historic contract. He's looking – to become the highest paid running back in the history of football. And to be truthful, he wants to be uh, higher paid than that. He wants to be the first guy thought of in a different way. Uh, what's called his, his sort of camp is saying he's, he's a running back one, as they call it, and a wide receiver two. And he wants to be paid as sort of a hybrid player uh, that sets this kind of financial landmark. I don't think it's going to work. But the report out there is he's looking for $50 million essentially over the first two years of his contract, which would destroy uh, the running back record, which is $27 million over that time frame. The receiver record is $38 million. So you can see what numbers he's shooting for. Uh, I, I don't think he's going to get there. Uh, but when you talk about the Eagles and where they stand from a cap standpoint, we know Howie Roseman can manipulate things, but he, there's a line you got to draw somewhere. And if that's the kind of conversation he wants to have, the Eagles simply can't get involved. Mm -hmm. Now, from a football standpoint, he's perfect fit. Three down running back who you can flex out any time. I think he would put this offense o o over the top. Now that's the 2017 Le'Veon Bell. There's another kind of thing you got to throw in the pot, and that's the fact that he he gained 30 pounds when he wasn't playing. So we sort of like the Michigan State Le'Veon Bell. Anybody who remembers him in college, uh, one of the knocks on him, he was this big, huge back, uh, not in the great greatest of shape, and he got to the NFL, and sort of the switch went off. And he got himself in tremendous condition, turned into a superstar, uh, took some time off when he wasn't playing. And he got back to sort of that, that Michigan State mentality. He's got to, so a lot of people are concerned what Le'Veon Bell's going to show up. Let me ask you, before we get, dig a little deeper into this, what did he achieve? I mean, what did he gain by not playing last year? He lost $14 million, right? <laughs> anything he lost 14 and a half million dollars never going to get it back ever uh like do you feel you that he argue. feels that he won like the, the, the stare down like because he tweeted out like thank you i'm finally free but he was going to be free at some point anyway unless he unless he just hated pittsburgh 
Well, yeah, not uh, technically, because if he signed uh, the franchise tag and he played uh, for that $14.5 million, uh, the Steelers would have been in the same position, but they probably would have had a different mentality over it and say he has an all-pro year. Uh, maybe they do franchise him yet again. So his goal, and it seemed to be sort of uh, uh, the only goal, was to get his freedom and to get to true unrestricted free agency, no franchise tag, no transition tag. Kevin Colbert, the GM of the Steelers, confirmed that's going to happen. Uh, they're not going to put either tag on him. So from that standpoint, he won. But – just from an accountant standpoint, you can never get that fourteen and a half million dollars. No matter how big the next contract is, you, you can never get that money back. No, no, no. I, I scratch my head every time I read that. Like he lost fourteen million, he became a free agent. He didn't play at all. Now he's getting bigger. You know, quite frankly, Connor had better numbers than he had. That doesn't mean he's better, but I mean, it kind of showed that hey. I don't know. I think he took a big chance. I don't know what he gained, but you're saying he wants $50 million in two years. I don't know that he gets that either. I mean, is there a possibility that he sits out another season until he gets what he wants? Uh, I don't – well, he's never – if he sits out another season, I, I mean, his, his value is just going to keep going in, in a negative trajectory. So this is it. I, I, I mean, he gets to a point uh, – ultimately, I do think if he, if he visits and shows people he's in shape, he's serious about playing – uh, I think ultimately he will surpass uh, Todd Gurley as the highest paid running back in, in football, but that's where he'll be. And that's natural. That's how it works. Uh, if you're a star at any position and you're up for the next contract, you're going to be the highest paid guy until the next uh, star at that position comes up. That's how, that's how it works. But, from the historic standpoint of what he wants and actually getting paid more than receivers, uh, getting $23 million more essentially than Todd Gurley got. I, I mean, I talked to an executive. That's what I wrote on, on, on 973ESPN.com. And he, I texted him. And he just kind of laughed and, and, and said, you don't pay what you don't have to. So it, it, in other words. Yeah, well, sorry, uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, in other words, Gurley got twenty-seven million over those first two years. Now, you think it's going to go? The next landmark's going to go from twenty-seven to fifty? I mean, there's not an executive in the history of football that's that dumb. Uh, so it, it's just not viable, right? The okay. So don't pay what you don't have to. I mean, in other words, he's going to have to event. You don't feel that he has hand is what I'm getting at here. He doesn't have the power. Well, I, I mean, it depends how you define power. I, I think he has power to the point where he'll be in the conversation to be the highest paid running back of all time. I, I think that's relevant. I think that's legitimate, and that's certainly something to be proud of. But when you talk about shattering uh, the current sort of financial setup, and that's what he's talking about, and that's what he's been talking about for two years. Uh, that part of it, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. He essentially... And his camp essentially wants to create a new position uh, in a hybrid running back, wide receiver. I deserve more than even the three down running backs because I'm like a running back that can turn into a wide receiver at, at, at you know, the drop of a dime. That's and, fine and dandy, but does he lose that leverage if he's not in Pittsburgh? Meaning, okay, that's great. You were that player in Pittsburgh, but you might not be that player in Cleveland or Philadelphia or New England, or you know what I mean? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's always about fit and system and, and teammates and all that. I, I think the guy from 2017 uh, and, and the guy before that, it is the best running back in football. It is the best three down uh, running back in football. So I, I don't think it's the point of people don't value him as a player or people think negatively uh, uh, of him as a player. I think it's about the unrealistic, and, and OBJ had this. Now, if you remember when Odell Beckham uh, was talking about becoming the highest paid player in NFL history. And and I talked about it on the show with you. 
it just wasn't going to happen. That's not the way the league works. Quarterbacks get paid more. But I did say he would be the highest paid receiver because it's his turn, and that's what happened. Yeah, And that's where Bell will be. He will be the highest paid running back, but that's it. Um, Why, you know, this is funny. Like, you're looking at all the things. A guy didn't play last year. Does that increase his value or drop it because you say, hey, this guy's got plenty of tread on the tires. Is that in play here? Yeah, I think you can talk yourself into it and say maybe that helps uh, because – when you talk about running backs in that position specifically, I mean, tread is a big part of it. And people get really, really concerned uh, when you hit 30. They get really concerned when you have over 300 touches. If you get up to 350, 400, you saw what happened to DeMarco Murray. People in Philadelphia saw that up close. Uh, he had his near MVP year in Dallas, and they gave him the football so much, and then he was done. You saw it with Sean Alexander. Uh, a lot of people in history, when they when they touch it that much, uh, the 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 spike uh, goes in a, a, a real bad direction really quickly. So I think there are teams that will talk themselves into the fact that that's helpful as long as he shows up and he's in shape. Though I, I mean, if he shows up and he's the 255 pound guy he was in college. Uh, that's going to concern people. Uh, a couple alternatives. If you're Philadelphia, number one, do you think Philadelphia looks to the free agent market at running back? Uh, I, I do. I, I mean, I think they're going to they're going to try to fix that position. So, uh, I mean, obviously you have avenues to do that. You have free agency. You have the trade market. You have the draft. Uh, I think you know. I wrote on Twitter, uh, you responded to me. We went back and forth a little bit about mock drafts, and they're fun for everybody. Uh, and I get that part of it. But they're utterly meaningless before those first two weeks of free agency because that kind of tells you what the strategy of every team is. Uh, if you're targeting running backs in free agency well, and they get one, well, then they're not going to go to the draft. Uh, if they don't, they're going to go to the draft and they see something of value there. What what is what is definite is the fact that the Eagles understand they need to upgrade at that position, and, and I think arguably uh, it could be the the position they need the biggest upgrade at. A couple names. See uh, if you feel the Eagles would have any interest in making a phone call. How about Tevin Coleman? Yeah, I, I think you know, that's more in their range uh, as far as uh, salary, as far as making something work. Uh, and that's a player I think that could help uh, and be uh, a more well-rounded option that they've had. Uh, I've talked a lot since Doug has gotten here, and I've talked to Doug about it. I've talked to Mike Groh about it and Frank Reich when he was here uh, about, and even Deuce Staley about, this committee setup and 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 what it does and 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 it creates headaches. Although they downplay it, the fact when you have so many backs, you start to develop tendencies, and defenses know that. So if they see one particular back in the game, they kind of know what you're going to likely be able to do. And the whole mentality of getting a Le'Veon Bell or a Christian McCaffrey. Uh, or an Alvin Kamara or a player like that is three downs. You don't tip anything off. You don't have tendencies. It makes it much more difficult for the defense. Now, Coleman's not a player like that, but he gets you closer to that than what they've had. Uh, Mark Ingram's another one that uh, has come up, and uh, we've talked about him a little bit, but, you know, he is a a bigger plotting guy. I mean, he's not, I don't want to say plotting guy, but in today's NFL, I guess that would be more. But he is a better pass catcher than I think people give him credit for. Yeah, I, I agree. He will be 30, I, though, I coming up. Yeah, I, I think he's more the Jay Ajahi type. Uh, and that would be an improvement. Uh, he's a good running you think, back. You think Ingram's better than Ajahi? Well, yeah, because uh, I, mm. I think – Ajayi, it's not that he's a bad player. It's the injury concern. Okay. And even before the ACL, he, he had degenerative uh, a knee condition. So 
that that's one of the issues built into it uh, is that people, one of the reasons Miami traded him along with the fact that Adam Gase can't get along with anybody was the fact that he's got those uh, degenerative knee conditions. Uh, and uh, then you tear the ACL on top of it. So I'm not saying Jay is a bad player. I think he's a good running back. Uh, but I was comparing their skill sets as they might be better receivers than you think, but they're not great receivers. Ingram's in that category as well. I don't think they're true three down backs, which is ultimately what I think the Eagles hope to get at some point. It's easier said than done. Uh, but I do think he's a better option only because he's, he's healthier and you don't have those injury concerns. A couple Eagles uh, names I want to throw your way uh, when we look at free agency. March the 15th, by the way, that is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, Ronald Darby expected to depart via free agency. Two seasons here, not healthy for both of them, really. I mean, he got hurt the first year, missed half the year. Last year, missed most of the year as well. Uh, You think he will get a lot of interest on the market? Thin class there? uh, Or because of the injuries, do the Eagles have a good chance of bringing him back? Well, I think the Eagles are hopeful uh, that the injuries will knock his price down because if he was healthy, he'd be getting a a monster deal. And I think the likelihood uh, of bringing him back would be virtually uh, nil. But as you mentioned uh, first, it's a really, really bad class at at corner. And I think somebody's going to be desperate enough uh, to throw a lot of money at a really talented guy and I, and I do think ultimately it's going to be very, very difficult for the Eagles to keep Ronald Darby. Uh, one name to watch, uh, Cap Casualty. Um, what about Nelson Aguilar? Yeah, I don't think the Eagles want to pay him his fifth-year option, which is just under $10 million. So something's got to be done. Uh, either they work out an extension that's more team-friendly that gets that number down, uh, or uh, I do think – there's a potential they move on because I can't imagine uh, they would pay him that final year of his rookie deal. They don't want that number on their books. Uh, it's not that they dislike him as a player, but something's got to be worked out. What if they lose Aguilar and Tate? I think they're going to keep one of the two, and I think it depends on negotiations. Uh, I, I, You know, Tate's – the whole class as a whole over every position isn't great. Uh, in free agency, probably with the exception of edge rusher. Uh, there's going to be a, a lot of good edge rushers. A lot of them are going to franchise, but some are going to get through, Brandon Graham being one of them. Um, it, it's a weak class as a whole. Uh, and uh, wide receiver is part of that. There aren't a lot of great receivers. And Tate's at the top of the list. So ultimately, I think he's probably going to get overpaid as well and that hurts the eagles in that front if they even want him back because obviously he wasn't a great fit when he was here uh what about michael bennett cap casualty or they want him back no i i think he's going to be back uh, i mean there's so much uncertainty at defensive end he's really uh yeah he's old obviously but he played at a really high level uh and his number's not that big uh, especially for that position so I think the Eagles are, are are confident he'll play at a high level for another year. Uh, what are, what are the chances? Concern. What are the chances him and Graham are both back? Well, I don't think Brandon's going to be back. Unfortunately, I, I think he's going to cash in. Uh, and and the only way he's coming back, and he loves it here. He's sort of like Nick Foles, in that people talk themselves into maybe he'll take less. Uh, Brandon essentially said he'd be willing to take a little bit less to stay in Philadelphia. Uh, but, man, uh, I mean, he, he if, if you look at – you understand DeMarcus Lawrence is going to get franchised and uh, D. Ford is going to get franchised. And, and then you start talking about Trey Flowers and Brandon, and, and they're not going to get franchised most likely. And they're going to be – those players at that position, which is arguably the second most important in professional football, they're going to get a lot of money. And I I don't know 
<laughs> how much uh, of a discount he's going to be willing to take because he's been underpaid for years. We talked about Vinny Curry a couple weeks ago, maybe last week when he got cut. And Brandon was getting less money than Vinny Curry for two years. I, 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 and he's tried to work on getting an extension. I think ultimately he's going to cash in in a big way, and the Eagles aren't going to be able to keep him. Chris Long? Well, Chris has said can say, Chris is under contract, uh, but he said he, he's only going to play if he's assured he's going to have a significant role. And from his standpoint, that means being a third down pass rusher. So I think a lot depends on what else happens. Uh, if Brandon Graham is back, yeah. if Michael Bennett is back, Derek Barnett, uh, maybe he retires hmm. because that role is not going to be there. But if he has a role, he still wants to play. And he's been consistent with that. And he said that on, on, a number of occasions. Uh, Sports Bash Live, just a little taste of what's going on with NFL free agency. We'll have plenty more. We know the draft is coming up. The Combine's on the way. Looking forward to bringing you all the coverage on the Sports Bash. John McMullen Daily right here on the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thanks, pal. Thanks, Mike.